Philip Music. I direct the Green Subsidies Program uh, along with Amir Nadav, who's in the back row here uh, over at the Great Plains Institute. I work at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Um, so today I'm excited to talk, talk about uh, frame up this topic for you all, a topic that along with traffic I think really brings out strong strong opinions. I, I worked for a, a neighbor association for, for eight years and uh, we can always guarantee um, the sort of passionate interest around garbage and traffic issues. So at the neighborhood level, at the city level, major issues. So um, uh, we'll briefly have uh, Tim Farnan, my colleague at the NPCA, um, uh, and also the best practice advisor for the Green Step Best Practice Number 22, uh, Waste Reduction. Uh, Tim's going to speak briefly uh, about compost, and then we're um, pleased to have um, uh, Susan Young with both associates uh, present work that she's doing, and then uh, seek your sort of responses, uh, thoughts um, that will all result in uh, much deeper information about uh, best management practices for, uh, for uh, solid waste uh, management and reduction. Um, as you know, the Green Step Cities website, we sort of continually evolve the best practice pages, and this is one of our first sort of deeper dives into a topic which is uh, quite uh, crucial, as I say, uh, evokes uh, strong emotions among um, citizens, touches uh, everyone in the household. So um, a few other details. So this is the sixth um, Green Step Cities workshop in our uh, series of eight this year. The next one is April 15th um, on the urban forestry. And then the, the May workshop has been shifted, and we're going to be talking about climate um, sort of, sort of resilience. Um, 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 climate adaptation, uh, emergency management issues, I think focused on buildings, but we have an opportunity to bring in a, a speaker in the sort of emerging uh, topic for uh, issue for cities. So that's the May and the final <coughs> workshop uh, of this series. Uh, a few other uh, notes as far as timing. Um, so May 1st, for a couple of reasons, May 1st is the key um, uh, a key day. Uh, Green Step Cities have uh, a very hard deadline of May 1st for number one, applying for a $1,000 um, prize uh, and a, a recognition and award being given by the League of Minnesota Cities and Green Step Cities for sort of excellence in, in um, uh, sustainable city work. So there's a form here. It's also on the front page of the Green Step Cities website, this, this application form. So that's one May 1st deadline. And the other May 1st deadline is um, for cities to make sure and go on the website and post any uh, best practice actions you've completed. Um, we take a look at them. It, May 1st is the last date, and then we send all that sort of information about what cities have done over to the League of Minnesota Cities Board of Directors that takes a look and then um, has the sort of final word on recognition of cities who have advanced to um, Step two recognition or step three recognition. So a couple of May first uh, dates. Um, so these workshops are um, uh, funded partly by the McKnight Foundation and Excel Energy, sort of the, the series sponsor. Um, uh, Metro, the Metro Clean Energy Resource Team, represented by Patrick Mat Matswick here, um, uh, the organizer. Um, Danielle Cameron is not here, but she's uh, from the League of Minnesota Cities that helps to organize this here. So I think those are the, um, yeah, um, introductory comments. I just want to say a quick word about sort of uh, overview of uh, solid waste uh, actions. But let's first just go around and just quick uh, introduction, uh, introduce yourself, sort of name and where you're hailing from, city or organization. So Tim, why don't we start with you? Uh, yeah, my name is Tim Parnon. I'm with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Patrick Maswick, Minnesota Green Corps member with the Great Plains Institute and uh, Metro Search. Uh, Jennifer Clenner with both. Ben Jameson, Hammond County. You got no Westlake on Township. Sue Bass, Dakota Valley Recycling, Bird Solving in Apple Valley. Joel Schilling. Matamidac City Council. 
Susan Young with both and former Forest Lake Council. Keen Buckley, Ramsey County. <coughs> Jake Wally, City of Frisley. <coughs> Hannah Vandenberg, Minnesota Green Corps and uh, State at the National Sports Center. Jeremy Gumke, uh, City of St. Anthony, Public Works. Mark Casey, City of St. Anthony. Singer Shirley, MPCA. I'm here to adopt Great Mercer. <coughs> And welcome to all the uh, webinar participants. Yeah, and so on the webinar, we have Allison Cole, Aubrey Fonfara, Brad Brayhans, Brenda Eklund, Elizabeth Harris, Hannah Beeler, Jacob Thunder, uh, Jean Lundquist, Kelly Kish, Christian Wahlberg, Jenna Larson, Mary McReynolds, Nate Keller, Paul Grinder. Rob Friend, Sharon Thompson, Tranton Diekman, and Zach Zajesta. Wonderful. Welcome all. Uh, webinar participants will be able to um, uh, type in questions as, as Matthew will field those when we get to the uh, really second half of, of Susan's <coughs> presentation, which will be soliciting your reactions to the uh, work that she has done today. Um, so I will do, and it probably won't be that readable, but um, I just wanted to make some comments about, uh, about solid waste and sort of solid waste action um, in the Green Subsidy Program. Um, obviously, materials, material management, um, sort of materials use, and then and then the, sort of the life cycle of dealing with waste show up in many ways in the uh, building and land use best practices. Uh, there are certainly ways to minimize uh, the construction and demolition waste and road construction waste through um, use of green building frameworks so their actions in several of the um, three of the be uh, best practices in those building and um, use best practices the ways to sort of minimize uh, waste um, and part of it is um, just how we sort of how we build our buildings um, uh, what we're um, uh, what we're building in terms of uh, size, density, uh, number of floors, and then uh, where we build. Um, so when we think about waste, I mean, today we're focusing on specifically on, on residential uh, solid waste, um, uh, recycling, composting, uh, reduction, and, and management especially. But there are these other big waste streams. And in the metro area, it seems like I saw maybe 10 or more years ago an analysis of of total waste, looking at industrial waste, construction, demolition waste, uh, uh, and then garbage, you know, a very high upwards of half, I believe, of sort of all that total waste is in this construction demolition uh, waste area. So there are actions um, in, in green set where cities can sort of deal with, with that uh, waste. Certainly in the transportation uh, VPs, um, we know that nationwide and in, in Minnesota, vehicle miles travel are decreasing. So despite all the sort of discussion this year at the legislature, um, we have, depending on your city, uh, we have you know, fewer cars, fewer miles driven, which means there are opportunities for um, continuing that trend through um, uh, alternatives to driving. And certainly in small towns, we see typically very, very wide uh, main streets, and so the ability to lock in savings by narrowing roads. Uh, we've certainly seen some of these uh, road dive conversions where you go from four lanes to three lanes, sometimes narrowing in, um, increasing green space, maybe stormwater infiltration on the road. Um, so you're you're sort of locking in less maintenance, less eventual um, uh, repairing and dealing with waste from from roads. So there's there are a few opportunities in the transportation best practices. Certainly in the environmental management best practices, the, the two main best practices dealing with waste are in, in the purchasing, environmental purchasing. Um, so looking at uh, cities purchasing sort of recycled contents, more durable and um, sort of reusable products. And then obviously best practice 22, which we focus on today, which focuses on residential recycling and waste management. And then in the economic and community development uh, best practices, uh, there are a couple of actions um, dealing with sort of assisting businesses in waste reduction and uh, waste or from a business's point of view or sort of byproducts or uh, byproduct reuse. And depend, again, depending on, 
on your city, um, uh, there may be very great opportunities in helping businesses decrease waste, even though possibly a city is, is not um, paying for or dealing with business waste. Typically, um, uh, helping uh, businesses and, and bringing resources to uh, businesses simply helps the businesses, uh, businesses bottom line. So, so that's sort of a big sort of uh, global overview um, of how we think about um, uh, solid waste in the Green Cities program. But again, today we focus on that just very, uh, really sort of intimate issue of our, um, our community members and um, waste management and, and, and best practices. So that's the heart of our session, but let me um, have Tim step up first and talk about uh, a timely issue around compost. Thanks, Philip. Uh, and uh, actually, before I get started, I just want to put in a brief plug for our uh, Minnesota Green Corps program. So uh, we are opening post-site applications for that, I believe, this week, uh, and that we do in early May. So any cities, counties, nonprofit organizations in the state could apply to be a host uh, for a Green Corps member beginning in September. Uh, those folks would serve with your organization for 11 months, uh, working full-time on, kind of, on some kind of sustainability project. Uh, I work most closely with our waste prevention members, but there are many other Green Step City uh, actions and practices that of course correspond well with the uh, type of work those folks can take on. So uh, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency's website has information about Green Corps. Uh, we just encourage any of you to look into it. I know uh, in the room today and on, online there are a few folks who've uh, been host sites or in other ways been associated with the program. And, uh, it's just a really great resource to help you get something done that you might otherwise not be able to take on. So I'm going to be talking today about uh, composting, and um, Philip kind of alluded to the fact that people do get very passionate about uh, their trash, uh, much like traffic, and uh, that was very much the case for us uh, at the Pollution Control Agency as we were looking at the uh, regulations that impact composting around the state. And so uh, we've been through a process over the last couple of years looking at those regulations and just recently completed some uh, revisions to the regulations that impact composting. And some of those uh, revisions are likely to impact uh, your life and cities. And so uh, I appreciate uh, Green Step Cities and the, and the opportunity to talk to you today about some of those changes so you can kind of be prepared as those come along. So <clears throat> thanks. So uh, the, just a little background information. Uh, organic waste is, is something that uh, I'm sure many of you have thought about to some extent. It's a very prominent component of the waste stream. When we looked at the trash that Minnesotans throw away in 2013, we found that about 40% of it could conceivably be composted. So uh, that's going to be any kind of food waste, non-recycled paper, things like napkins, paper plates, uh, paper towels, as well as uh, compostable plastics. Um, so it's a, it's a very uh, a prominent component of what's ending up in the trash. Uh, there are many benefits to getting it out of the trash and making it into compost. In the metro area here, the legislature adopted new goals for the metropolitan counties, and it's uh, tasking all of us with getting to a 75% recycling rate by the year 2030. Um, and so uh, we're not going to get there unless we figure out how to capture uh, and recycle organic material. Uh, and there's also been a lot of changes in how we manage and collect organic material in the uh, state. If we were looking at our composting programs 20 years ago, the last time we looked closely at the regulations, in many cases, we were not sort of separating that material. We were taking it out on the back end. So at trash processing facilities, they were trying to pull organic material out and uh, compost it uh, after the fact. And uh, that's really not the way we're doing it anymore. Now, for the most part, if businesses or residents are um, recycling organics, uh, they're separating it out from their trash on their own. It never ends up in the same bin as the trash. And as such, the uh, risk for pollutants to enter the environment is reduced. And so um, for those reasons, we at the state and many of our partners in local government and elsewhere thought it was appropriate for us to look at and revise the regulations for uh, composting facilities. And today my, my talk will focus a little bit more on on-site composting, because that very much was involved in this too. And I think that's going to be an issue that will most directly impact uh, those of you in local government. So just uh, I always like to start these talks by kind of reminding us why this is important. I think a lot of folks maybe think you throw that banana peel in a landfill and it just breaks down and makes dirt. 
and is that really different from composting? But the reality is it doesn't quite work that way. Um, when we separate out our organic material, it's very similar to recycling conceptually. We're making a useful product in this case. Instead of making a can out of a recycled can, we're making a soil amendment. We're making compost. Um, so, you know, conceptually, it's much like recycling in that we're getting something that's useful uh, out of what would otherwise be a, a waste material. Um, also, much like recycling, there's a lot of jobs tied with the composting industry. Um, so the Minnesota Composting Council, an organization I'm also affiliated with, um, recently did an economic study, and, and there are uh, many Minnesotans who um, get income, who spend money in the state because of uh, uh, this kind of green activity. Uh, and we also believe that composting has potentially reduced greenhouse gas emissions, uh, particularly when organic waste ends up in landfills, where you can create methane gas. Uh, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. And then unique to compost, uh, the product itself has a lot of environmental benefits. So um, it reduces the need for pesticides and herbicides. Uh, it helps us improve drought resistance, you know, so particular, particularly as we're focusing on um, adapting to climate change. I think compost can be a really useful tool for us and would definitely encourage cities to look at opportunities to incorporate compost into your uh, landscaping activities into your roadside improvement projects. Um, compost can also help prevent water pollution by um, making sure soils are better able to um, retain uh, water and prevent pollutants from entering lakes and streams, rivers, and those types of things. So the photos you see here uh, show an application that the Minnesota Department of Transportation used along a roadway. And I, I think it's a real nice visual to kind of demonstrate how effective compost can be at, uh, kind of the vegetating land, uh, helping it be um, you know, the resource we all want it to be. So um, as I mentioned, you know, I'm really talking a lot today about how we revise some of these regulations, uh, both for on-site composting, for uh, you know, individual residents or businesses, as well as for the types of material that get collected in curbside or commercial organics recycling programs. Um, and so, you know, our, our objective really was to kind of streamline those requirements, to modernize them with current practices. We also, um, I got a terrible acronym in there, SSOM means source separated organic material. Uh, we want to make sure that, uh, um, particularly when we've got large scale composting facilities, that their practices are still protective of the environment. And then we wanted to add flexibility. Um, as I mentioned, we've charged uh, the, whole, the metro area with getting to the 75% recycling rate. Certainly there are many cities and communities in greater Minnesota that are also looking at organic recycling, and we want to make sure that these rules um, allow them to kind of tailor approaches to what's appropriate in their own communities. So. Um, Just a minor technical difficulty here. Yeah. All right, back in business here. So, so prior to this rule revision, we really had kind of three categories for composting. The one you guys probably dealt with most was backyard composting. Many cities have ordinances that govern practices for backyard composting. Um, in many cities or counties may also offer yard waste compost sites. Those are facilities that can take things like leaves, grass clippings, brush, but they have not been allowed to take food waste or non-recyclable paper or some of those other materials that we talked about earlier. And then we've had what we call the solid waste compost facility. That's material, that's a facility that's uh, usually pretty large scale, can take that yard waste in addition to the food waste, the non-recyclable paper, the compostable plastics, that kind of wide array of organic material. Um, that we need to get that full 40% of material in the waste stream. But as I mentioned earlier, that solid waste compost facility, the regulations for those were really designed for the days when we pulled that material out on the back end. And so there was a lot of um, processes in place, a lot of the design criteria for those facilities that really uh, necessitated um, you know, a larger level of protection than we think is necessary now. Um, and then the backyard composting has changed a little bit too. When we looked at this uh, 
the definition that the state rules had for backyard composting, really only a person who was generating waste in their own household and their own business could compost it on site. You were technically in conflict with those regulations if you had two households sharing a compost pile, if you had a community garden that was doing some composting. Um, if you had a university that wanted to do some on-site composting, they would have needed to obtain a full solid waste compost facility permit to be in line with the regulations. So we didn't think that was necessary, and as such, uh, we revised the rules to look like you see on this slide. So we've got essentially two categories now of um, composting that don't require any kind of permit from us at all. The first is backyard composting, um, and that was only minorly modified from uh, the definition that was before. And then the, the uh, category I want to make sure we touch on with all of you folks today is this new small compost site category. So that's intended for community gardens, universities, urban farms, uh, those types of entities. But they're allowed to um, compost on site. They can take material from multiple different sources and locations and have up to 120 cubic yards of material on site at any given time, um, which should allow for more uh, on site composting, but also has some potential to cause some nuisance issues if not managed properly. So we'll touch on that in a moment. We really didn't change the other two existing designations for the professional composters. The yard waste site remains exactly like it did before, as does the solid waste compost facility. So any of the um, composters that have been operating in the state are allowed to continue to do so just as they were before. But they also now have the option of going in at the source separate organic materials facility, um, which, which has some potentially economic advantages in terms of reduced capital costs. So backyard compost sites, this is something that uh, initially we had uh, in earlier drafts of the rule, just we were going to just mesh this all into one small compost site. Um, like Philip said, people get passionate about these types of things, and people really didn't like that idea. They wanted to make sure that, uh, uh, I think some of it was maybe not understanding our intentions, thinking that we might be sending inspectors out to look at their backyard compost piles, that was really never on the table, um, but because we've allow these small compost sites to, again, be a little bit larger. We do now have some provisions in state rules designed to make sure they're kind of following best practices. So the small compost site definition is a little bit more prescriptive than the backyard site definition. So what we did with the backyard definition is we really didn't touch it, except for we took any commercial properties or apartment buildings, entities that are likely to be dealing with larger amounts of material, and move those into the small site definition. But anybody who's backyard composting otherwise should be not impacted by this change. They should be able to continue to put their food waste, their uh, yard waste in their own backyard compost pile and continue to manage it just like they have before. And most likely many of your cities do have ordinances that govern this type of activity. Might have things in it like location requirements, making sure it's at least three feet from a property line. Might have container requirements so that you don't have to deal with uh, birds or rodents, those kinds of things. Um, so those are all uh, you know, appropriate things that I think cities have benefited from having those kinds of practices in place. But um, the small compost sites are new, and so city ordinances likely have not yet been thought about this or dealt with it. Um, and uh, for that reason, I'm very appreciative to, to Philip and Amir and others for giving the, getting the opportunity to talk with you. Um, you know, so these are things where cities might want to look at their local composting ordinances and figure out what's going to work best for your community. So, the state definition for small compost sites allows up to 120 cubic yards of material to be managed on site. And that would be any yard waste, any food waste, any non-recyclable paper. Um, so there, uh, you know, it's also a slightly broader array of materials than is accepted under a backyard compost pile. Again, that non-recyclable paper, those compostable plastics would be allowed in these settings. Um, they do not need to get a permit from the state to operate a small compost site. So uh, whether it's a community garden, an urban farm, we've got uh, entities like the University of Minnesota Morris doing small site composting, um, any uh, registrations, any permits would all happen at the local level. Um, they are a little bit limited in food in feedstocks. The professional composters can make provisions to accept things like manure, um, other materials that might be a little bit dif more difficult to manage, um, but these are if you're going to fit into the small site designation, you really got to be limited to just food waste, non-recyclable uh, paper, compostable plastic, those types of things. Um, 
We're going to be the Minnesota Composting Council has partnered with the Association of Recycling Managers, and we're going to be having a workshop. Uh, it'll be from 9 p.m. To, or 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. on May 5th, um, where we're going to be talking in depth about a lot of these uh, uh, considerations. I'll give you a few more details in a moment about that workshop, um, but uh, you know, that might be an opportunity to uh, think a little bit more about this. I'll just real briefly touch on the um, regulations for the professional compost facilities. Um, as I mentioned, we've just streamlined some of those requirements, and there's maybe some reduction in the capital costs needed to build a facility, some operational efficiencies. I don't think this is necessarily going to be a big concern for cities, um, although we hope, particularly those of you in densely populated areas, are maybe thinking about curbside collection programs. And the hope is that by making this a little bit more efficient, that will help reduce costs, make it a little bit more feasible for more of you to look into those. And I think Susan will touch a little bit on um, some of the considerations with organics collection programs. I know um, both has done some work with the city of Minneapolis to really look collect at specific um, kind of collection practices. And so you know, if your cities are thinking about that, please feel free to talk to me. I'm sure both would be happy to talk about their study with you. Um, Minneapolis and many other cities are looking very closely at curbside collection of this material. And, um, we really hope that that takes off. Certainly also commercial collection is a real big deal for um, grocers, for restaurants, for entities that are generating lots of organic material. Having a composting program can be a great way to reduce costs and practice uh, environmentally friendly behaviors. So to the extent that your cities are working with those folks, um, you know, letting them know about composting is a great way to go. In Ramsey, Washington, and Hennepin County, there are a lot of business grants available to help businesses get set up with those activities. So um, if you can help promote those, that'd be a great, great thing. Um, as far as these small combo sites, you know, they're, again, slightly larger scale. And so, um, you know, as you're thinking about what ordinances are appropriate, um, you want to make sure that these folks are kind of following composting best practices. So. Um, Things like having the right carbon to nitrogen ratio, making sure they're managing the pile correctly, making sure people are putting the right types of materials in the compost pile are going to be the most important things to, to be sure that you don't have odor issues, to be sure that you aren't dealing with you know, raccoons or mice or those types of issues that can sometimes come with composting. Um, I would really encourage any of you who are thinking about modifying your ordinances to maybe attend some composting workshops. There are a lot of them offered sometimes by master gardeners. Uh, uh, again, there's the event that we're going to be having at the Minnesota Composting Council on May 5th. Um, and you know, maybe make sure that those opportunities are available to composters in your community. Uh, think about hosting some backyard composting workshops, those types of things. Um, and, and it's really going to be the same concept in play at the small compost sites as it is in the backyard compost sites, um, but just the potential for issues is maybe a little bit larger. Um, and then we've got the two fact sheets that you see here that will kind of run you through some of those basics about how to compost if it's not something you're familiar with. Um, it can also be used as education resources for anyone in your community who's trying to do the small site composting. So I just want to make sure that those were available to you. We are working uh, with the Minnesota Composting Council and the Association of Recycling Managers on some model ordinances that really help you think through the issues related to these small compost sites. So we're targeting having that done by the May 5th uh, workshop. Um, the little document you see up there was uh, produced in 2001 by the Solid Waste Management Coordinating Board. It's kind of a model ordinance for backyard composting. So we're really kind of using that as a framework to update it and to think about the issues associated with these small compost sites. Um, so that will be available. We'll promote it uh, when it is ready. Uh, and certainly uh, we'll be talking with Philip, making sure that we help our Green Step cities uh, know when that's out. And it'll be talked about in detail at this uh, May 5th workshop. Um, the workshop will also cover uh, some additional, uh, we're going to have Tom Hallbach from the University of Minnesota talk about sort of the basics of composting so you guys can feel confident um, if you're talking to people in your community about what those best practices are. We're going to have people who are operating small sites, people who are experienced backyard composters uh, uh, talking. We'll also run through the model ordinance discuss some of these regulation changes that we've talked about today. So with that, I don't know, do you guys want to hold questions to the end, or did you want to take a few now? Okay. Okay. There's two. Um, so Sean uh, 
with the Lions at if you know if there's any metro counties that are looking at large compost processing sites, and then um, if there's a website that lists the local composting ordinance metro cities. But I think you cover that. Yeah, so uh, it, to the first question, uh, I don't think there are many local governments that are looking at operating compost sites. There are a number of privately operated compost sites that uh, typically local governments, private haulers, others contract with to manage that material. So um, there's a few, usually they're not in the most densely populated areas. They can, uh, uh, even a well-run facility can have some level of odor, some of those types of things. So, um, you know, we've got some in Dakota County, uh, up in Becker, Minnesota. So there's usually a need when you're talking about the commercial scale for these for them to be a little bit of a distance from the most densely populated areas. Sue. Yes. Um, I saw in your presentation that you had a sign that looked like it would go on a uh, container and it said organics for composting. And I have a question about terminology. It's uh, it's been confusing to try and educate people uh, exactly what organics are. And I've heard organics for recycling, organics for composting. Is there a specific terminology that uh, is most appropriate? That's a great question, and, and it's quite frankly one of the biggest challenges I think we've had in trying to get people to think about, uh, I like to use the word recycling this material. Um, the Minnesota Composting Council, the Association of Recycling Managers, and, and Swim Club have been talking exactly about that terminology. We are making progress on a style guide that we're hoping will um, allow us to have sort of preferred terminology. The vision is never that it would be mandatory or required that people use it. There might be specific applications where we can deviate from that. But um, this organics for composting is something that we're I think leaning towards using certainly the color green um, is something that seems to be settled on green for organics and blue for recycling um, and you know, one of the important things is composting is just one type of organics recycling um, we also have uh, prominent food to livestock programs um, where particularly commercials generators restaurants grocers might be separating uh, food waste and bringing it to maybe fed the pigs, so then we would say organics for livestock, um, and then we've got um, food rescue programs as well, where edible food that's maybe no longer saleable from, again, a restaurant or grocer is brought to food banks and reused. So uh, both of those methods are actually considered preferable to composting, you know, particularly the food to um, people, that donation process is for reuse, to source reduction, so it's a much better um, environmental choice when we have that opportunity. So to try and get back to the question, organics for composting is, I think, the direction that we're, we're moving toward. Okay. Um, just to piggyback on that quickly before I do my question, um, just like we're trying to do uh, between Ramsey and Oka County and Hennepin County for recycling to try to uh, use the banner, the color, the type style, and so on, and perhaps what products are developed could be put on the um, our website, um, InDesign files available, you know, for smaller cities like ours. Uh, that would help a lot. And then trying to get a statewide look to it all like you're, you're attempting, but produce more product in different formats so it's flexible for us. Anyway, but that wasn't really my question. Uh, my question is, I, I think it's going to be, you know, relatively easy for us to get, you know, people juiced up about organics for composting. I think we can do a good job because you know, we've got the pattern for recycling uh, in place, and we need to do it. But I see there's a huge gap here just rolling out the new composting regulation without actually Met Council and MPCA identifying, you know, logical spots for these very large compost sites to be located within proximity for our garbage haulers. What I'm hearing from our haulers is that they're trucking some as far as Iowa and far southwestern, you know, metro. Um, that's just not really practical for them, you know, to have a profile that's affordable to collect the stuff. So, I mean, I think that either if you grant, yes, private enterprise is going to have to do it, but I think you're going to have to get a lot more strategic about it than just kind of waving their hands and saying, here's the new regulation, good luck, guys. Thanks for that comment. 
And I think that's a, a very valid point um, and, and totally agree that these are things we need to continue to, to work on. You know, getting this regulatory framework in place is really just the first step. Um, and so we are looking really closely at things like transfer capacity um, and other things that will hopefully help um, spur us along a little faster. Um, you know, and there are, and I think Susan might touch on some of these, there are other challenges. Uh, ML dashboard is a big challenge for us. Um, but there's uh, regulations where the quarantine counties can't would waste outside of those areas. So there's a lot that goes into it. Um, but um, I think that's a, a great point. One just quick thing, these signs that you see on the slide here are available on the Recycle uh, Recycling Association of Minnesota website. And we are talking with Swim Club about I'm from a uh, rural area, and so um, organized collection for organic, I don't think makes a lot of sense for us because people have larger lots. But if we take those organics out of the waste recycle stream, how do we measure that in order to know that we're meeting the 75% goal? Yeah, that's a, that's a really huge challenge, and I wish I had a better answer for you, quite frankly. Um, but you know, I think in those communities, that's particularly the ones we were envisioning looking at more on-site composting, uh, because you're right, that kind of population density, I think, is going to be important to make, you know, curbside or commercial collection economically feasible. Um, but we got to work on, I think, you know, and uh, we do have some estimates, and I think, you know, when we've been talking with the counties about their county plans, particularly in rural Minnesota, We've indicated that we're okay with them making some estimates, provided that there's some logic, some documentation behind them to, to account for some of that material. And um, it's just something that we'll have to keep working on. You know, certainly if you're working with a university or a community garden and you could convince them that there's some value in doing some tracking, I think that would be a great thing. So two questions from Terry Gibbs um, with the Alliance. So he says, thanks for the great work. Tim, um, it's all very exciting. And have you seen any challenges from cities who are opposed to the composting? And then he asks, who can participate in the May 5th composting workshop? Is there a cost? Um, what is the promotion for it? Um, Brittany asks, does he think there's a, a lot of interest in the public learning how to compost? And wondering if you thought about offering additional workshops in St. Louis Park, there would be a lot of interest there. Sure. Um, yeah, so to the workshop, the workshop is really open to anyone. I think the intended audience is local government folks. It's going to really be focused a lot on those kind of ordinance considerations and the, the training and education considerations. But anyone who's interested is welcome to attend. Uh, if, if you're a member of either ARM or the MNCC, I believe it's a $40 cost. If you are not, I think it's a $50 cost. So there is a, there is a fee associated with it. Um, but again, open to really anyone. We we're hoping to host a Greater Minnesota conference uh, or kind of repeat that workshop, although we've had a little trouble pulling that together, so that's not scheduled right now. That would likely be in June. Um, so, uh, so I think that's most of the question. I guess, uh, you know, I think a lot of cities are looking at this too. I know St. Louis Park, uh, which has an active curbside organic recycling program, has done a lot of uh, outreach to try and engage their community. Um, and, and you know, certainly we're happy to work with them in the future so that they have uh, more opportunities to talk about organic recycling folks. All right, I think, um, thank you, Tim. Um, obviously, Tim is, is available <coughs> through the Green Set Cities uh, uh, website, um, the best practice advisor, so feel free to contact him more. So let me introduce uh, Susan Young. We're very happy to have um, contracted with Wealth Associates to really do this deeper dive, um, and there'll be a number of products um, coming out of this work that uh, Wealth is doing for Green Step City under this MPCA uh, contract. So Susan's going to talk about her work and um, uh, to say work products uh, that come out of that, but part of that work involves um, presenting um, ideas developed to date um, and then uh, seeking feedback from you. And some details about Susan, but I think of Susan as certainly knowing the city intimately, <coughs> having uh, served on the Forest Lake uh, City Council, helping Forest Lake become a great yeah. city, um, and then having really done a masterful job of uh, uh, Minneapolis residents sort of running a, a recycling program that 
probably really maximize the sort of uh, value out of recycled uh, products. So, Susan, welcome. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, I don't have to talk trash. It's what I do. Um, when folks started this project, and folks, you're going to have to help me with where I am on this, this mic. And folks that know me realize that you've given me two different tools here. You've given me a clicker for one hand and a mic for the other hand. And I am not known as the most coordinated of individuals. So just realize that there may be some issues here. Um, when we talk to the PCA about this project, they would like to move toward a good, better, best um, system in the Green Step program where realizing that all cities don't have 10 or 15 staff members just dedicated to recycling organics and solid waste issues, um, what are ways that cities can start into um, doing some better practices in solid waste management um, as they get their feet on the ground, maybe have some volunteers that excited about it, maybe partner with some other cities or some other organizations. How could they take next steps? So that's the, the concept that we're working on. Okay. And what am I doing? Okay. 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 Um, overview on the Green Steps, for those of you that aren't really familiar with the program, um, Green Step cities are on path toward improved sustainability and quality of life for residents. Um, the 28 best practices, as, um, as someone who's, who's been working to get my city's uh, Green Step program in place, they're broader than I ever thought they were, and I think that there are more opportunities for cities to be sustainable. Quite frankly, coming from a very conservative, fiscally conservative city on my city side, um, the sell on this is not about the base. Okay, it's not about the base, about the base. It's about the money. All right, it's about the money, honey. And what I found in, in my city was that there are things in the Green Step program that sustainable really means saving energy, saving money, saving resources, saving money, saving time, saving money. So um, those 28 best practices, I think, uh, have some potential for more cities. The best practices are staged and tiered. We're taking advantage of that staging on the good, better, best. Um, and then benefits of their own choosing. One of the best practices uh, of the 28 is solid waste reduction. And currently there are eight waste reduction best practices. Um, that are currently part of that that action, that, that best practice. Um, what we're doing today, I'm going to go through that fairly quickly, I hope. Great. We're focusing on three areas to expand for the best practices. One is to improve solid waste recycling licensing. Um, this is licensing of your haulers. I see this as, quite frankly, protection for your citizens, um, but it also provides opportunities for cities to get at some of those numbers that counties and states are going to be, and the state are going to be asking more of cities. It also provides you with a better framework in your cities um, for working with the haulers. Maximizing residential recycling collections, this is the big, the, the big nut that we've tried to track, tried to for 30 years now, um, maximizing recycling collections, looking at that for maybe a different way, putting some more ideas in there. Um, I'm going to focus a lot in on some of the synergy that is available. For instance, just on composting, not only do you have the PCA and the swim club, but Minnesota Horticultural Society has great classes. Um, the um, Extension, Minnesota University Extension, has opportunities for cities to partner with. Um, so I think that finding synergy is going to be one of the things in the Green Step Toolkit that we're going to be able to focus on. And then maximizing efficiency in garbage collection, uh, recycling collection, organic collection, um, optimizing even through licensing, some voluntary or citywide organized collection. Um, we're expanding the practice areas. When I'm looking at this, the good, better, best, 
we're developing matrices where, and I'll show you one in just a second, um, going from a, a least intensive, easiest to get into, easiest to get your toes into, to a little bit higher difficulty, higher return, higher management, higher touch, that will give you a better return on your investment. Um, we're developing a range of options from least intensive through some higher difficulty stuff. And the options have varying levels. The options that we're working on so far, varying levels of benefit or travel on the path towards sustainability. Here's one of the simple matrices. This is licensing of garbage and recycling haulers and um, as you move up the, the chain, licensing of C&D haulers. There are very few good things that happen when a trash truck or a recycling vehicle or a C&D roll-off interacts with one of your residents um, or one of their vehicles. One of the things about licensing that is very important from a base case, um, and I'm going to be able to, to, to walk up um, and show folks here, but um, for those of you on the webinar, on the lower left corner, licensing all garbage and recycling haulers with minimal requirements. Um, we'll go into some of those because I'm going to use this as an example of good, better, best. Um, then moving into licensing garbage and recycling with better requirements, uh, a little more intensive, a little bit more higher touch, and then licensing roll-off haulers, um, level of effort that will give you um, a higher level of effort but not a huge environmental benefit, and then moving on in the top right to licensing all garbage and recycling with best requirements, and then roll licensing the roll-off haulers. On the good, uh, that bottom left-hand corner, licensing all your garbage and recycling haulers with minimal requirements for the license, insurance. Um, this is a protection for your citizens, making sure that if there is an interaction between a large truck and a family in their vehicle, that those companies that are in your city, that you are giving a license in your city, have adequate protections. Uh, publish tiered fees. Again, we're looking at improving sustainability, um, requiring your haulers as part of having a license in your city to have a published tiered fees. Um, and the published part would have some meaning. Um, there are several cities that we've looked at recently where their published fees uh, have very little, extraordinarily little relationship to what is actually on the bill. Uh, we recently um, received bills from residents of one of the cities that we work with, and the spread for a single family house was more than $50 um, between the lowest and the highest. Um, neighbors, quite frankly. Um, this, having a standard list of recyclables as part of your um, license for your hauler. Washington County has recently come out with what they expect their city to have as a standard list of, re hauler, of recyclables that was part of a, a group that was convened and um, folks here were really important in that group. Having a standard list of recyclables is part of your licensing for your haulers. Um, requiring that your recycling container volume be equal or more than 65 gallons. In other words, we know that convenience is important. We know that having enough room in the container. You know, if you put a pizza box in a 20-gallon container, that's about all you're going to put in there. And then people say, well, I don't have any more room for recyclables. Well, as part of your licensing requirements, you do have the ability as a city to say, if you are going to haul in our city, use our city streets, take advantage of our residents, then there are things that we expect of you. And then the all-important recording requirements. Um, on good licensing efforts, we're laying these things out. We realize that many cities will not be able to strictly enforce all of these requirements. But getting them on the table, getting them started, beginning the education program is where we're looking at. For better licensing efforts, better you're moving up that chain. So this would be in the middle of that matrix chart. You'd have all of the good, all the requirements from that good garbage and licensing requirement. But then say, OK, if you're, since we're going to have a, a tiered system, 
garbage haulers in our city, we want you to provide our residents with an every other week option. As part of, we're not going to tell you how much you have to charge. We're not going to tell you um, what size container every other week is. But we want you to have an every other week option for our residents to be able to use. Um, as part of our licensing, we expect that you will have yard waste, source separated organics, and bulkies as a subscription service. Again, we're not expecting you to do this for free as part of our license and the license to haul in our city, but we do expect you to offer these services. And then begin to license roll off and CD haulers um, with the insurance, requiring them to give some education. Some of these CD haulers do a phenomenal job on their websites of talking about CDs that can be recycled, um, of doing education, of doing on-site uh, programs. Some don't. Again, as part of your ability to license haulers to use your streets, your facilities, operate in your city, um, it is not unreasonable to ask the indie haulers to provide education and then report back to you on, um, report on, on, uh, on what they're hauling in your city how much they're recycling, how much they're disposing of. And then the best, this would be up in that top right hand corner of the matrix. Um, incorporating the good and the better that you've already done. Again, this is a stepwise. We phase into this over years. Um, having the good and the better for garbage and recycling haulers. Having yard waste and source separate organics included with the weekly small container service adding electronics, adding bulkies with other weekly services, saying, you know, this should be part of your services. We're not telling you you have to do it for free. There is a charge. We understand that. And then roll off the CD with required recycling percentages and required reporting requirements. Again, good, better, best gives you opportunities to ease into these programs, gives your haulers opportunities to ease into these programs, realizing that with the new reporting requirements, most of the hauls are going to be doing this anyway. With the new demand from customers, as customers are having less waste, there's going to be this demand anyway. You still have the opportunity to do partnerships. This one looks scary, okay? This is, this is the matrix for recycling. But then again, of course it would be a little more complicated because we've been doing this recycling gig for a little longer. Um, this one is where, in the toolkit, um, I am planning on having lots and lots and lots of tools available for you. All of us in the trade realize that we're, we've kind of hit this wall, hit this plateau on recycling. Um, we have a generation now that really wasn't raised with woodsy, really, okay, yeah, okay, I dated myself. <laughs> okay, get there. Uh, really wasn't raised with ionized coating. Um, we're seeing in some of our data that even though younger folks say they're pretty environmentally tapped, they're so convenience oriented that they're not doing the recycling thing, they're not doing the waste minimization. So trying to tap into some synergy, trying to tap into some tools, realizing that cities don't have a lot of um, production staff for new video, let's take advantage of each other. Let's take advantage of what's out there. So on um, this one, a lot of the tools in the Green Step Toolkit will be um, draft letters, draft ordinances, um, draft um, links to Keep America Beautiful, for instance. Has anybody, think about whether or not you've seen either on the webinar or here, some of the Keep America recycling videos on I Want to Be. I love the little plastic bottles. Okay, the little plastic bottles, it, it gets people engaged, it's making its way to the ocean, it's going to become a bench, it does a lot of good recycling messages that yes, we can recycle, yes, things are made into something else. Um, so links to things that you could put on your city's website. Have a recycling tab, and one of the, the things in the bottom left-hand corner on the good is putting a tab on your city's website. Most of the cities are doing a great job now with improving their city website. Put a recycling tab on that website. And then once a month, once every other week, find a volunteer in your community who would come in and add some content to that site. Say, 
hey, we noticed that the Lake Elmo Inn is now doing food to hogs and it's doing a great thing for our city. Or we've just noticed that the community garden is now accepting organics. Or here's a link to a new video from Keep America Beautiful. Or here are some new signs that businesses you can use. Or as a city, we've invited uh, waste flies to come in with our Chamber of Commerce. Every, all business members are invited. That kind of a tab is pretty low cost, low energy, but it can start to reinvigorate, regenerate some of the interest in recycling. Um, some of the opportunities in what we'll call the middle box. Um, implement a get caught, get caught recycling initiative. Aspen does this. Um, Small city, good impact. Um, recruit environmental block leaders. Work with your police department. Get some synergy. Your police department has got some block leaders who are engaged in some of their community policing options. They're doing, um, whether in August or other times of the year, some opportunities of getting blocks together. Work with those folks and get some synergy so that maybe as a block organization, they're doing recycling. or one of the block leaders would say, you know what? My house is really into doing the block reporting and, 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 and the, the, the crime thing, but my passion is organic. So I'm going to, since he's the block leader, people are coming to us anyway, I'm going to be the organic guru. Start to recruit those folks. Get some synergy. Again, this is something that is a medium effort. Examples of the kinds of things that we want to put into the Green Steps program for medium effort. Medium payback, good opportunities. Okay, up there on the scary right hand side, high right, all right, high effort but then high reward. Um, what to implement some mandatory recycling? Do you realize how many cities in their ordinances currently say recycling is mandatory at all single family homes? I've looked at a lot of ordinances recently. Quite frankly, I'm kind of scared because many of the city ordinances were written in the 70s. Those really are scary. Um, on the other hand, even in the 70s, some of those ordinances did say recycling is mandatory. You may not have been enforcing that. One of the things down in that lower left-hand corner is making sure that your ordinances provide for required recycling or required opportunities for recycling. Up here on the high right side, we say, OK, <clears throat> we've had this thing on the books for a while. And now it's about time for us to say, yes, you really, really need to do this. No, I'm not suggesting San Francisco garbage police. All right? There are other ways of doing this. Um, well, that would be an interesting gig, wouldn't it? OK, so um, implement mandatory recycling for what I've got here, SUDs, single unit dwellings. I believe that's the current term of art. Uh, yes, because um, the term family, uh, single family, was was sort of um, prejudicial. Okay. Uh, so we're, we're saying, calling them single unit dwellings or multiple unit dwellings. Um, implement mandatory recycling in all multiple unit dwellings. Tie that to their um, rental license. Again, get some synergy in your community. Your, your rental license inspectors, if you've got them, are going out on a regular basis, adding a line on the check sheet, letting them know what recycling looks like. That's not that difficult, really, to do, both as a city staff person and as somebody on the elected side. That is something that you can ask them to do, the one line item. And then what you do is you say, OK, I've reported it back. Our recycling folks have got canned letters. Again, part of the toolkit is going to be canned letters. Um, at the office, we call them Susan's bad dog, no biscuit letters. Um, that, that are basically, I've, I've written some for some communities in Iowa, where they're basically, you know what? We notice that your complex doesn't have enough recycling capacity for the folks um, that, are, that are there. We notice that your complex doesn't have some signage. Here's some free signage for you. Here are some opportunities for you to save a little money, because recycling costs less for you to dispose of, and there's a lower tax. And here are some handouts and flyers for your residents. Pushing, 
proportion of multi-unit residences in this top right-hand corner toward more mandatory recycling, giving them some ideas, giving them some help, but then saying, you know, this really is the law. It's a state law that now we're enforcing. Um, these are some of the slides um, on the base effort. The mandatory recyclables uh, separation in the city ordinances as an education tool, bottom left-hand corner, down there in the good. Requiring space for recycling containers next to trash containers in your zoning codes. Again, get the synergy in your city. One of the things that, that we'd like to do with the Green Step program is there's lots of opportunities for overlap. And there's lots of opportunities in one action to send messages to several different parts of your community. Um, talk about reuse recycling tab. Um, the mid bundle recycling practices, talked about some of those that get caught recycling. The local chamber of commerce. Um, as a mid-level, um, requiring quarterly reporting of non-recyclers, there will be, um, my plan is to have in the toolkit some of those bad dog no biscuit letters and, wow, you know what, we notice that you're a phenomenal recycler and we really appreciate that. I've got another city in Iowa that once a month at the city council meeting, a random family that has been caught recycling gets recognized at the city council meeting. It doesn't cost you anything. It's a feel-good thing. Everybody likes to be on TV. Oh, yeah. And then that high level, the mandatory recycling for singles, uh, routine encouragement enforcement at the household level and the mandatory. Um, that recycling matrix um, was more filled in, had lots of middlers, what I call them. Um, one of the things that Minneapolis does that was very, very popular was an email reminder. Most of the cities have got email lists. You know where your folks live. You know what their zone is, especially if you have a zone community for recycling. You know what zone that house is for recycling. An email reminder the night before, the day before, 48 hours before recycling um, <laughs> is one of those middler actions that we're going to talk about in the toolkit. Um, requiring re provision of recycling opportunities. That's a middler thing. It's not quite bottom left. It's not quite high right. Um, promoting America Recycle Day. That KAD website got lots of tools. Use the synergy. We want to make sure that the Green Staff cities have opportunities to use the synergy that the Green Step Toolkit is a place where you can go to for ways to help you get going. Improving collection efficiency. Um, this is this is one that is, is pretty sensitive right now. A lot of action in the Twin Cities, a lot of action nationwide in being more efficient on collections. Um, and this goes on the bottom left from merely licensing all your trash and recycling haulers and setting collection zones for service day. Um, a middler is providing a cookbook um, for St. Paul recently did this, Bloomington had one for quite a while, um, for neighborhoods or blocks to organize their waste and recycling collections. In the middle, uh, an RFP for citywide recycling, yard waste and SSO. Um, most of you are kind of familiar with the statute, 115A, that says how one will go through the organized collection process. There are things you can do to organize collections, to be more efficient, to have fewer trucks on your streets, to get some really great monetary savings for your residents without going to a full-blown organized collection system. And one of the, 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 the center in here, this, this, this center of the matrix, is an RFP for citywide recycling, yard waste, and source separate organics. Now, yard waste is start because there is a city that went out for an RFP, um, included yard waste, and they had a legal challenge to having yard waste included in that RFP. Recycling is not part of 115A.94, yada, yada, yada. All right, it is not part of the statute. In Minnesota state law, source separate organics and yard waste are called out as recyclables. 
And so there is a legal argument to be made that you could do a citywide RFP for those materials. I just need you to know that there is a challenge. As we work through the Green Steps process, get a little bit more clarity, we're going to make sure that we give you tools that are strong and defensible for you. Um, there are a lot of benefits to your citizens and to you um, for going out for an RFP for recyclables. One hauler, one collector, one system, one set of recyclables in your city. Joe at 2953 has the same one through seven plastics or um, yes pizza boxes, yes lids on your plastic bottles, and Sam doesn't have, well no, they only take one and two white bottles for my recycler and I can't do pizza boxes and no lids and no pumps. With the recycling um, RFP so that you organize your city for recycling, you get some significant advantages both on collection efficiency and cost savings, on your ability to help educate your citizens and help them be good recyclers, um, and you start being more comfortable with, you know, it's, we're not taking away a lot of choice. And then up there in the top right hand corner um, is the RFP for citywide trash recycling yard waste. Um, I strongly encourage bulky waste and source separate organic as part of those RFPs. Um, as we look at increasing garbage fees, both in the state and nationwide, what tends to happen is that folks say, I don't want this mattress anymore. Why should it cost me 30 bucks to get rid of it all by itself? And then I have to put it in my Honda Civic and try and get it to some landfill or transfer station or something or other. Um, having bulky waste is going to be not only a cost savings for your residents, a huge livability concern, um, and especially in some of the uh, core urban and first ring suburbs, but more and more in the rural areas. I live out in the country, and I'm really, really tired of cleaning up in the spring 12 tires, one refrigerator, three mattresses, oh yeah, and there was a computer um, from my bar ditch, my bar ditch along the road. Um, so that, that RFP. Part of um, our contract with the PCA is that we will have draft language, um, draft tools, um, ways that, that folks have done this. This is, a, again, a review in the bottom left-hand corner on the good, the zones, and the licensing. The middle effort, not using the statute, realizing it's kind of scary, the recycling yard waste and SSO. Um, and then the high effort, high collection, uh, efficiency gain. Again, it's not about the base, it's about the money. Um, we recently, um, I told you, took some, got some bills, and the spread is very significant. Not every single person in your cities, if you go to fully organized collection, will see a lower bill. There are some folks that are really good. They don't they have more time than I do. Um, but they call their hauler every couple of months and say, you know, somebody came by the door and <clears throat> offered me a really good deal and I'm, I'm going to change unless you cut my price. And you can get some really low prices. So not everybody in your city will um, see a lower price of work that we have done for one city. Um, that by the time this is published, we should be able to have some of that information available, shows that there is a significant savings when a competitive arrangement is done, a competitive arrangement for organized collection. Um, good. We have plenty of time. Uh, after your advice today, and we're gonna, I'm going to be asking for a lot of your ideas on what should be in the toolkit. Are there other things that you think should be as part of the good, better, best? Um, the practices will be expanded or removed as y'all are recommending and, and the PCA says yes, no, or, or otherwise. We're going to be developing specific stock ordinances, licenses, and, and uh, RFPs. Uh, examples of programs and education practices that will be bundled together 
under some of those good, better, best scenarios, and how two models are going to be put together. For instance, this is the bare bones, and anybody who's done organized collection knows that this looks really pretty and simple, and it ain't quite that simple. But we'll give you what are the basics, what are the steps, what are things that other communities have done, what are the progress other communities have made. There are an amazing number of cities in Minnesota that have done organized collection for 20 years. Um, this, is, this is not as new and scary as, as, as some folks think, but it can be a little more complicated than this chart shows. So we're going to try and help you out with some of those things. Um, other new tools, all these links um, are live on this presentation. So if you uh, are in slide chill mode um, on the presentation, um, these links are live. Um, examples of a licensing ordinance, we'll have several of those in there. Uh, resource management RFPs, Stillwater School District uh, recently met, went to a modified resource management RFP, not a full, full born. You know, resource management contracts are where the hauler and you both share in savings that the hauler's expertise gives you. Um, that can be a little difficult to manage and document. Again, we have some staff, you know, short staff resources. Still want to to a, 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 a modified program and has saved a very significant amount of money on their trash hauling. Um, so we'll have some examples of things like that. They also get great reporting requirements and it gives them very good feedback so that they know if a particular school um, needs a little bit more help in understanding which container is the recycling container and which is the garbage container. And um, keeping the lid down uh, as, as you start to measure weight on your recycling and trash, spring rain and uh, winter snow are heavier than you think they might be. So we'll have tools. Some of those ideas, lessons learned from communities that, that we've talked to or, or learned from. And then the new best management practices will be put in the Green Step, Step website for um, your use. All the models in there are going to be custom, able to be customized. Your city attorneys, each one of them has their own ideas about what they think is appropriate for your city. Your city councils have very strong opinions about what's appropriate for your cities, but we'll have frameworks that you all can work from. It's a whole lot easier to hit on and carve up things that somebody else has started than to begin from scratch all by yourself. And then these new best management practices are going to reflect your use and ideas. There'll be some feedback loops that the PCA will be able to use to as cities report what they've done, then Green Step will be able to incorporate some of the things that you've done and the additions that you've made. And that'd be me. Jennifer is also here um, with both, and those are how you can get a hold of us. Do you want to take the break? Yeah. Um, so as I was listening earlier, just to make sure we get discussion started, um, there are city ordinances that I've looked at that do not allow any composting whatsoever. So as, as I start to look at ordinances, I'm going to be making sure that the ordinance models that I have um, in there include some of the um, better practices on composting ordinances. Um, be working with you on that. Um, Drop-offs for organics is probably one of the middling um, uh, waste reduction tools that I think is a good model that Ramsey County is using. Yeah, great. Um, so I think that that, as I've heard today, that, that's going to be a tool. But I'd like to hear from both the folks on the webinar and the folks in the room. Um, thoughts, ideas, where have I missed the boat? Um, where would you like more emphasis? Are there, there are tools that you know of that have worked really well for you? Um, that you would like to see included in Green Sense. I've got a question. Uh, I'm wondering if there's an opportunity to look at um, 
curbside recycling best practices. I know that uh, St. Paul's program has been in the media a little bit uh, with their switch to single stream and not seeing a big bump. And I think you know some of us think that might be tied to the type of containers they're using. I know a lot of cities have biweekly recycling programs. Others have weekly recycling programs. Um, so I wonder if there's an opportunity to kind of say what kind of advantage you get from looking at weekly collection, what kind of advantage you get from using a cart instead of a bin, some of those kinds of uh, nuts and bolts type things that cities have to consider. On the recycling matrix, um, toward the top right is weekly recycling. Um, there is a lot of evidence that shows that weekly recycling is um, something that will increase your tonnage. You know, we're humans, and, and I'm sorry, my brain doesn't always remember that this happens to be a recycling week. And if I miss it, and I'm a really fanatic recycler, just ask my daughter, ask my ex, I'm a fanatic recycler, I would have an overflowing cart if I miss recycling week. Well, all those overflows go into the garbage. On the other hand, if my recycling is every week, I don't have to worry about that. And um, there is evidence in both nationally and in Minnesota that a, a weekly recycling system um, does result in higher diversion. You have another trash truck. And so looking at, or you have another vehicle weekly. So looking at those systems um, as a system, and that's why organized collection is so sweet in some ways, because you can look at the system uh, and you're not piecemealing things together. Do you want to do web or we got lots of hands here? I guess, yeah, there's a one here. I, Susan, I had one that kind of picked yeah. back on what you just yeah. said. If you remember me, we were I certainly do. We were on a Washington County uh, scorecard committee together two years ago, I think it was. Uh -huh. And the, the comment I have was back then we were talking about about uh, weekly collections as increasing it. And I was uh, very happy to see that you also have container size because we just went out for RFP and we changed our hauler. One of our big discussions was what size container are we going to have as the standard. And we went from a 64 to a, a 94. And I still see containers that are overflowing all the time when they come by to pick them up. So ours has increased just by increasing the container size because people can put the recycles in there instead of throwing them in the trash. And that's a really great point. Again, we're dealing with humans. Humans want convenience. OK, so there are times when I have aggression issues. And there is nothing like going out to the garage and stomping down those plastic milk bottles. That saves room. But most people aren't that way. and. Our recyclables today are fluffy. We don't have as much paper in the recyclables that matted down. Our recyclables are fluffy, not stuffy. And so a pizza box, those one yellow milk containers, really do fill up recycling. And so, yes, as part of the higher on, the, um, on that matrix for recycling, container size and um, frequency are in there. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, the city of Frisbee has organized recycling at least. And we did a contract in 2012 that expired in 2019. And two of the things that I learned from the contract, uh, roll out 96 gallons and ask for forgiveness later uh, because even small garages can accommodate the larger container because it's wider at the top. The second thing is maybe not quite so long a contract. There might be some pricing advantages. And yes, we've got a very good contract. but be able to make some shifts and be a little bit nimbler regarding uh, source separated organics, that might be slightly too long a contract. Maybe five is, is the perfect time period. So what we're trying to do is retrofit the <coughs> recycling neighborhoods. We have every other week collection, but they're squawking from the hauler because this is an additional cost that was unanticipated. So anyway, there's some issues there, but definitely uh, to piggyback on what was said earlier, to use the large containers. And, don't look back and let them go at least six weeks after a program rollout and then allow them to go back and dial back to a smaller size container. Um, have them try it for a while. We did that with the 65 and almost nobody wanted to go down to smaller, but in retrospect, it should have been a larger container yet. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yes. Uh, so Sean Kaczewski, um asked, um, what is, are there any efforts to 
quantify the benefits for road longevity from having organized collection? University of Minnesota Mankato did a, um, a study which is uh, going to be part of the toolkit and which is broadly available uh, on road impacts. And um, that is relatively easy. Most of the cities do have a city engineer. Relatively easy. It's available to the University of Minnesota product. Um, and I can make sure that it's on the, um, the website for you guys. Um, yes, that, that tool is available on quantifying road impacts. Um, engineers are like, are like other folks. They, they all have opinions, and um, this is one study that has been well documented and well qualified. Uh, having just gone through a defeated organized collection process, uh, we hired an independent engineering firm to use that uh, Mankato tool and were basically got to about 200000 annually in, in defrayed costs. But if you start looking at the length of time between a, when a neighborhood road or street is, is repaired or replaced, uh, that didn't translate into compelling reasons for residents. What was compelling was how far down did you dial my monthly bill with doing trying to do garbage hauling consolidation. And so it continued marketing by haulers without buyer pricing is what really defeated it. Right. And so while the multiplying tool is excellent, it didn't really create the emphasis for change in our community. It's not about the base, it's about the bucket. Um, one of the things that uh, does not, and in another community that folks is working with, um, this was brought up. One of the things that um, that folks that do not like the tool will say is, well, you know, on those big collector streets, the trash trucks are not the, you know, are, there's only you know five or six of them compared to three semis. Those big collector streets are not the streets that are a problem for most cities. It's the cul-de-sacs. It's the single-family streets. Those communities that have allowed um, private streets and for developers to come in um, under a PUD to have uh, either reduced width or reduced pavement depth, um, some of those other innovative ways to reduce housing costs, those have significant issues. Those streets are often the streets that cities do a full assessment on um, to pay for redoing the street. Um, and so when you use that tool, one of the things that you need to think about is the streets that, that you're going to be evaluating, what are the level of use of those streets? How were those streets constructed? Um, because I know from the city that I live in, um, if we do a, a, a reconstruct on a street in 10 years instead of 25 years, and that is a full assessment for the reconstruction, that is a huge cost to residents. And so um, organized collection is as much about the education and as much about the looking at all of the pieces of the puzzle which is why I think that the toolkit and having some of those experiences of cities um, is going to be really important. You're, you're right. It's it's the dollars, and and you know, in in, in when there is a, a you know a forty dollar fifty dollar spread between the lowest cost and the highest cost, um, no, you're not going to get every single person that's going to have a lower cost. I think that um, one of the things in the statute that folks don't realize is that um, companies are really not supposed to, once the city has announced its intention to begin the organized collection process, six months prior to that is when the um, market share, the all-important market share is determined. Um, and so you know, that, that wiggling just before a decision is made should not be as important. Other questions? Yeah. We have um, single recycling hauler. Mm -hmm. 
but we have the uh, residents that choose their own garbage hauler. And I'm wondering, we're, th we're thinking of going with a single garbage hauler and license treatment through the, uh, through the township. Do you know if there's an advantage of bundling the garbage with the recycling in terms of cost? Or if we do those two separate, is it going to come out about the same? The cutting people one, as an example, um, did not bundle their two contracts. And I would say that their recycling contract is one of the most competitive in the state. Um, you have an opportunity to get smaller haulers, perhaps, um, if you don't bundle your contracts. Um, you have an opportunity to uh, phase them. Uh, that's a little more work for both the city and the city council members. Um, but there are some opportunities. I don't think that there's a large database yet on, on, on solid information. But as I've seen a couple of cities, um, the cities that I'm familiar with, they have been a little bit more competitive. Um, but on the, on the garbage side, I would really recommend looking at bulkies and perhaps yard waste as part of your garbage contract, if you're going to go that way. And you've already got a recycling contract. Yep, Ms. Wally. Uh, and maybe the possibility would be to do both, because um, in our recent failed organized uh, garbage collection, uh, one of the stated reasons why it was only a 17% uh, reduction compared to their stated prices, and stated is sort of a relative term, um, was that we weren't bundling recycling with it. Um, because that was that you could make money doing that, and otherwise you have just cost. But I'm not so sure. We've got a pretty decent recycling contract too. So you know, if you have the possibility of doing both, maybe one can do that. And there's another city that's doing organized collection that right now is being told, well, you know, the recycling costs are just killing. We could give you a lot better contract, but boy, those recycling costs they're just killing us. <laughs> And if I may, um, if you, Jennifer Claire with both, if you do decide to leave the two contracts separate, make sure that the, the end dates are consistent though so that you have that option in the future. So make sure that they are concurrent contracts down the road. It's, it's great to have two, but if all of a sudden your recycling contract expires in 2019 and your trash is 2021, you never have that option again. So definitely have concurrent dates if you're going to have multiple contracts. And what sort of length of contracts, contracts, um, obviously, it, it, might there be a good, better, best in terms of length? I think that there's not hard, and folks that know me know that I am a really, I'm a, I'm a data wonk, that's, that's who I am, it's what I do. Um, I don't think there's really strong, hard data. Um, I will tell you that in my experience, five-year contracts are a good, it, it gives a private company the ability to write down and use tax laws um, for their investment. Um, but on the other hand, it provides flexibility for the cities. Um, especially in the solid waste industry, we do have lots of changes, um, whether it's recycling markets, whether it's sort of separate organic collection. Whoever, whoever found that stupid green bug in Dakota County, um, that, that will change sort of separate organics collections in um, the opportunities in Ramsey and Hudson County. Absolutely. Um, so those kinds of changes happen fairly quickly. And so, yes, a city council has gone to a contract. They don't ever want to go through that again. It's like selecting a new city engineer. It's like selecting a new city attorney. It's like you know, all those contracts that cities do say, never again, I don't want to do this. On the other hand, you really do owe it to your constituents to do these things frequently enough so that you're getting um, the, the best and brightest and newest and the ability to change. Jean? Thank you, Susan, for all your work you do on this. Um, I was just frustrated with the um, messaging that the Metro and State, I'm sure, does on recycling. And I know we've tried to have TCA work on some educational pieces too. We've had Swim Club try and come up with um, 
a message that can be used nationwide, but it's, I think, hard for cities um, and counties to try and come up with consistent messaging because of the various materials that are picked up and things like that. But I think keeping it in front of people is very important. And the place I think is most important is at the hauler level, because they're the ones who really see what their customers are doing or not doing correctly. And talking to the haulers, they are not marketing communication majors. They are ops people. They know how to pick it up and take it somewhere very, very well. Um, so in your best practices area, I was hoping maybe you could figure out how to have some consistent messaging coming from the hauling community because you know we, we keep trying and I think that they're the front line people that could be doing a better job. We talk about participation. They know which customers are participating and which ones are not. And they could be doing a much better job at targeting, and they choose not to. Um, don't know how, not sure, but I think that that would be an important piece to include somehow. And where I've got that right now is in the licensing, um, uh, as part of that good, better, best on licensing. And quite frankly, I believe very strongly in city-approved hauler messaging. Um, and, and so as, as I talk to PCA and, and they decide what's in their final um, documents, um, that is something I'll be strongly recommending. Again, with the good, better, best on licensing, um, having increases in the frequency of education, uh, having changes in the reporting back from haulers, to the city of, um, for instance, those, those folks that have ever recycled. So that the city then has an opportunity to write a letter and say, you know what, we've noticed this or that. Um, so right now it's in licensing, but I think that um, there's another place where I'd like to see some more consistency. And that is, um, you know, we, we do our thing at home. And then we're other places. We're not, we're not home for most of our day. Um, and so having, as part of our good, better, best, and recycling practices, having cities um, be able to have best practices around away from home recycling. Um, messages, um, having canned messages in the, in the toolkit that you could announce at basketball or football games um, so that you have something just hand to your school district or hand to um, FLA as an organization in Forest Lake and say, you know, here, here's some canned messages on recycling and oh, by the way, as a city, we have made sure that you have appropriate containers and we've taken advantage of some signage from a, a, a website, a current website that you're going to see in lots of other places. Um, so there's lots of ways that messaging needs to be more consistent, but um, I'll include not only in the licensing, but in the recycling toolkit. Um, and the good, better, best, the reporting. Can I just add one thing? We're government, we're here to help. And don't tell me what to do with my garbage is often the pushback we get. And so that's why I guess I'm trying to encourage that the message starts coming from the hauler. Because if the haulers you know, don't like reporting who's not, their customers are not recycling, and then the letter comes from government, uh-oh, the haulers have tattled on me. So if the hauler could be the one who is saying, customer, we can save you some money, reduce your, your garbage cart or something if you're recycling more, and here's some information about it. So I guess there's, there's ways to get that information in the hauler's hands. So there are the frontline ones who are saying, you know, Joe Smith, you need to be doing a better job recycling. Instead of the government telling Joe Smith. Okay, let's, look, we'll, we'll take a look at some of those options. Patrick? Just a little addition to that. I know from experience that Surge Clean Energy Resource Team, they made a lighting guide that then they provided that template to utilities and cities that they could rebrand it to them to give to their customers. And that has been something that has worked well for them, that if you create a general fact sheet on recycling or composting, that then the haulers of the cities could mm -hmm. brand for themselves, maybe tweak a little bit. It, they need you for their city, and then send out. That could be good. And then there's also a question yep. online. So Mary Reynolds says, can you speak a bit about the pros and cons of municipal collection comparison to contract for smaller, to contract for smaller cities and towns? 
There are pluses and minuses. Um, I worked with a city in Illinois recently um, that did a very detailed economic analysis of city employees um, versus a contracted operation. Um, and they found that because of the ability to get some synergy within the city and to be able to use those city employees at non... Okay, um, garbage and recycling is pretty cyclical, all right? Garbage guys hate the week after Christmas and the week after New Year's, okay? Those are our heaviest, heaviest, heaviest times. On the other hand, there are times during the year when garbage and recycling time is not quite as heavy and you can maybe move some employees um, to other functions. If your city is using city employees for yard waste, for instance, they can be plowing snow in the wintertime. Um, some of your routes that are heavy at, at spring and fall, not as heavy, and you don't need extra people um, in the middle of the summer, you can throw a guy out a paving crew. Um, when you're doing garbage collection, you need to make sure that you've got enough folks to always, always, always have what I call a float crew. Um, but on the other hand, if everybody shows up to work today, some of those float crew could go and be laborers on a sewer crew or on paving or on some other street maintenance or tree maintenance activities. Um, there are opportunities for cities um, to look at the economic of city employees and city hauling. It does give you a little bit more control um, over what the systems are. The upfront costs can be a bit of a challenge unless you are willing to go into it um, at the beginning with some used equipment or phase things in or, or look at grants. Um, but those economic analyses are out there. Unfortunately, they are very, very city specific because every city handles their public works functions a little bit differently and has different opportunities. Um, so those, those options are out there. Um, I would not recommend cities doing their own processing of recyclables and marketing of recyclables. Um, with that, it's all about the volume and being able to um, cooperate on getting better processing and marketing of recyclables. Um, that's something that is very difficult for cities to do. Um, I think that's part of it. And Mary, I'm looking forward to talking to you this afternoon. Um, Ms. Holly? Uh, another issue that you touched on briefly uh, has to do with bulky items and reporting thereof. Uh, when I request tonnage for six month periods for recycling reporting, uh, I, I get pushback from the garbage haulers that are picking up the bulky items uh, saying, well, nobody asks us for that information. And that's, well, if it's residentially generated, then I am legitimately asking for this information on touch. Uh, it, it's a continual pushback issue, even though I ask the same, I make the same request every six months, year after year. Uh, another thing is, trying to determine what percentage or what amount of these bulkies are actually recycled, I, I get a sense from some haulers that zero of the bulky items are recycled except for any electronics they pull out. So mattress is a big problem if you have a high rental population and so our community are not really being recycled. Even though when we have a drop-off event, we have a recycler that does recycle the mattresses we collect three to four times a year. I'm not getting a sense that the haulers are doing that at all. So that's a little beyond a smaller city's capacity to sort of mandate that or to improve both the reporting and, and uh, use or, or location of where these products are ending up. One of the things that some of the PCA folks have talked about is, is having um, a lot of, of reporting requirements in, in some of the base of the the licensing, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, this is, this is painful for all of us, but part of licensing is holding people accountable and being willing to say, if you are not complying with the requirements of this license, then you are no longer licensed to haul in our city. It is a privilege, not a right, to use our streets and to have a license in our city. 
And if you are not complying with our licensing requirements, then you are no longer welcome here. Um, I know that there are a couple of counties that have been talking to specific haulers because the haulers are not complying with the county licenses. And they have been saying, okay, then you realize that you're licensed to haul in this county um, is in jeopardy. And it was, oh, you, you really mean that? You, you, you know, it's, it's, people get offended because I say I train my kids the same way I train my horses and my dogs. Um, but it's all about consistency and consequences. And yes, if I say it, I mean it. And you get, you get the good dog and you get the bad dog, no risk it. Um, and so it is very difficult for cities to hold licensees accountable, um, whether it's um, part of your zoning regs, or it's part of your fire code, or it's part of your, your building code. But holding them accountable for actually producing a report is one thing, but trying to create accuracy in that reporting is well beyond the city's ability, because we have no way of knowing where the stuff is, is going and if any of it is recyclable. Every hauler, when they, when they, when they dump that truck, they get a receipt. They get a weight ticket, they get a receipt wherever they go, whether it's a recycling facility, whether it's a mattress drop-off. I will say that for a hauler to, um, in 700 stops, to put a mattress someplace that's separate um, is very, very difficult, which is why a, a bulky waste route um, that some cities have put together is, is a little bit better because then you can, on one truck, separate out mattress recyclables and, and, and take them to a, a location that probably also takes um, refrigerators, washing machines, lawnmowers, snow blowers, um, a variety of things um, that are also recyclable on a, on a separate bulky waste truck. But having those materials on a trash truck is very difficult for a hauler to separate out. And those, yes, are probably going to be disposed. Well, they're not ending up on trash trucks. Almost all the haulers do separate bulky waste runs. But they're combined with other cities, and you don't know whether the stuff is getting recycled right or not. It's not because it's mixed with trash, necessarily. And, and again, you have the ability through your licensing ordinance to say, we need your receipts. Um, if, if you've taken um, your appliances um, and electronics to JRs, there should be a receipt there. Um, and that's something that the PCA and the counties are having a real struggle with because, quite frankly, with the exception of a couple of cities, all of the city's garbage and recycling and for stuff organics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are commingled. And um, it is, uh, in my opinion, an absolute crapshoot on whether or not any of the cities, unless they they have their own very specific data management, um, are getting solid information. It is, it's, it's a challenge that I know the PCA has been struggling with, the counties are struggling with. I think that the reporting requirements that, that Tim um, and I discussed a little bit earlier this morning, um, some of that may be helpful. Uh, Washington County has uh, informed their haulers of some new reporting requirements that, um, that they're looking at that um, I know we're all going to be really interested to see if that helps um, on getting better data. It's a huge struggle. It's just brutal. And, and uh, I understand that from several different perspectives. Sir. My name is Mark Casey with the City of St. Anthony. And we actually will be beginning uh, organized collection for refuse and recycling on April 1st. So we went through the entire process, and we stopped a little early without we're prepared to go to the RFP, but we chose to stop at the consortium model. Um, I have an entire presentation available as a resource if anybody's ever interested on in what we did, lessons learned. Once again, we still haven't implemented yet until April 1st. But for anybody that's interested, we'd be more than happy to share it. Um, what we looked at in a sense the same is we kind of went on a process of 16 priorities, and price is only one of the priorities. 
and we realized that one priority doesn't have weight over another. And I think that's helped us out a lot for be able to get this through. Uh, just a little add-on when you're talking about the price of the roads and the degradation. Another one to add in there is also alleys, because for communities that have alleys, traditionally a lot of them are 100% accessible. We found we had a lot of support with that also. But, and then finally, we kind of looked at it also as kind of consumer protection. So people sometimes grab so much of that price. But as you talked about in regards to uh, two neighbors, different prices, you know, we are able to look, take a look at that and say, well, folks be able to have, can we as a city provide that consumer protection for the prices that aren't going to be changing up and down and all those other areas in regards to it. So hopefully that will resonate with our residents also. Mr. Casey, would you be willing to allow that presentation eventually to go on that GreenStep website? Sure. That would be truly awesome. That would be that would be so helpful. Paul Gardner asks, should cities be putting their hauler licenses on their website? Most cities have their ordinances and their license applications on their websites. Um, so I, I guess the individual license itself has some confidential information. Um, cities that license things, um, I know that after looking at um, massage therapist licenses and liquor licenses and all sorts of other things as a council member, there are things that are not public information. So. Um, some of those license, some of that license information is not public, um, and so shouldn't be. But I think that the ordinances um, that the licenses are based on, licensing applications, the, the, the blank ones, most cities have those on their websites now. Susan uh, Joel Schilling, Montevideo. Tough question, and would be useful for both St. Anthony and Fridley. Quiet streets. Um, Montevideo has five haulers. Not unusual. Um, and all of you know that the industry has changed with respect to delivery vehicles. We won't name names, but we all know that that is changing convenience. Mm -hmm. I'm going to buy something, you know where I'm going. So we don't really have quiet streets anymore. We don't have a lot of sidewalks. But we have an aging population that wants to use the streets. Do you have any sort of anecdotal thinking or comments that have come up um, in terms of public safety and people wanting to get out and get some exercise and not have to compete with all of these trucks. And I'm serious, it has increased. There is a huge amount of anecdotal information about that. Uh, and in fact, in a couple of cities in Minnesota that are organizing that has been the impetus of neighborhood groups uh, and some of the groups that are, are organizing on a voluntary basis of their neighborhood or of their cul-de-sac are doing it specifically for that reason and are saying, you know what, it may cost us an additional three or four dollars a month to have one hauler on this cul-de-sac or in, in this particular neighborhood, but the safety aspects and the quiet aspects are, are really important to us. Um, so there is a lot of anecdotal information about that, and um, as you look at some of the, the blogs that neighborhoods are putting up, that is becoming a, a huge issue. Um, as I said earlier, there, there's nothing good that happens when trash trucks and, and residents interact. Um, whether it's a kid on a bike who comes out of nowhere, um, I know that that was something when I worked for Minneapolis that um, a lot of the alleys. Uh, were brush in the alleys was a big deal to us, um, not only because it tears our trucks apart, but because we didn't want kids in the summertime to be able to hide behind something and then then, then get hurt. And we were we were very very fortunate. But um, the more trucks you have, the more potential for interaction there is. And um, so yes, there are. It's mostly anecdotal, not a lot of hard data. Um, but that is becoming, and I think it was one of your criteria um, in St. Anthony. It was one of their 16 criteria. Um, I know that um, there are other cities that as they've gone through the organized collection statute, minimizing the number of trucks, minimizing noise, minimizing safety interactions, 
uh, has been part of their criteria for organized, organizing collections. Susan, just to clarify, um, oops, sorry, just to clarify um, so when you had uh, so you put out an RFP for garbage and recycling and bulk and organics, that you to do that a city needs to use the 111A um, uh, legislation. If a city is going to organize garbage, they have to use 115A. Um, recycling, no. Um, source separate organics, we believe no. there may be some some challenges to that. Yard waste, there has been some challenge to that. Bulkies, there may be a challenge to that. Um, again, depending on whether it's a recyclable or not. Um, so that's um, garbage, absolutely. Recycling, no. Um, and then depending on how things are framed in state statutes and um, who's willing to pay an attorney. Um, We've got about five minutes. I want to make sure that if folks have got other ideas for us, I've been writing things down for, for things to include. Um, Ms. Pollock. Uh, we worked out a flow chart with the League of Minnesota Cities attorney that was the elaborate version of what you had earlier in one of your slides. And that might be something just to look at. Um, the, the, in 115A.94, uh, if you want to take the next step to a committee, in our case because it failed uh, on a closed vote for organized collection, um, it's kind of nebulous. The language is nebulous there. I think some work should be done on what the structure of the committee should look like, or perhaps even encourage cities to have that committee formed up and at the ready. And we didn't do that, and we had a more contentious uh, situation in Fridley than, than St. Anthony had. Um, for them, congratulations. But uh, if that committee had been maybe formed up, because everybody's really tired at the end of the process and, it's, and it's, it's been a tremendous amount of work, but having a next step kind of poised and ready might, might have been useful. It might not have been, but what does that committee really look like? What's it supposed to be made up of? Uh, I think Green Step Cities and or the League of Minnesota Cities together coming out with maybe some boilerplate language or recommendations in that regard could be useful. Very, very good. Great idea. And, and actually, I would just add, could, could not the Fridley City Council, after voting down what came to it, could the council have not immediately directed staff to put out an RFP under 111A or 115A? Uh, an RFP could? No, the city council? No. You, you've got to go through a kind of committee process. Oh, the committee has to be charged, and then the RFP. And, and the committee may may decide on something different than an RFP, um, so that the, the committee needs to go through its work. Uh, um, but I think that there are there's some good ideas about um, poss possible committee structures. Yes. Susan, what what do you tell uh, what do you tell a big city that's got <laughs> He's talking to it. What do you tell a big city that's got nine haulers and nine recycling vehicles, 18 trucks on the street, and a city administrator who doesn't want to take this on? I mean, what what is the what is the what's the elevator conversation that gets a mayor or the council to say we need to get up off our seats and do something? That is the, the beauty and the ugly of a representative democracy. Um, you know, if, if there is a, um, a public good to um, organized collection, um, we're going to have a lot of those benefits of public good um, detailed in, in the Green Step document. Uh, on the other hand, there are also other pressures on both city administrators and on city council members and mayors um, that that organized collection may not be right for every single city. Um, in terms of the nine holler sorts of things, there's some really great models nationwide. Phoenix was one of the first of them um, that zoned their city 
so that they have opportunities for many haulers um, to to have to continue to have hauling, so that we weren't putting businesses um, out of place. Um, the consortium model that is in uh, 115A provides that same opportunity. Um, but I think that what what is happening um, over and over again in cities is that it is not the city administrator, it is Joe and Jill public saying to their elected representatives, you know what, I'm really tired at 6 o'clock in the morning and at 6.05 and at 6.10 and at 6.17 having the parade of garbage trucks and their <laughs> back up um, waking up my kids in the summertime. So um, those, those messages really need to come from Joe and Joe Public through elected representatives. Um, and I think that as more and more cities look at um, organized collection, as more and more people see um, what's happening in other cities, more and more people talk to their neighbors. Um, what, what do you mean you're getting this for six bucks? I'm seeing him 32. Um, that, that those conversations, um, you'll, you'll see more and more of, of um, opportunities to look at it. But you'll also see, I think, in smaller communities and, um, and even larger ones where um, where haulers are going to start to, to say, well, you know what? We need to look at a different business model. This well. One, one possible thought, um, you know, back to which our issue was price, as I said earlier in Chrissy, but um, to do something like Maplewood did with a bring in your bill, because um, anecdotal bill uh, information, um, you know, I'm only paying nine bucks every three months type of thing, uh, is really not all useful when, you know, things are hitting the floor at a council meeting. So doing some uh, survey work ahead of time where you actually can see a bill. So the fuel surcharge part of things, the, the tax that may or may not be tax generated from your county that may be added on to your county's residence, whatever the, the case may be, that to, to really get down to the unit pricing might help to inform a council or a city manager about uh, where the pricing is really at. And that's something that we didn't do maybe as thorough a job as we could have. We, we, got a certain number, but maybe a pre-survey kind of thing could be useful. Go. <laughs> I can take this answer. Um, we actually did a price survey for a community that's currently looking at organized collection, and um, we collected 275 invoices, which was representative of all of their haulers that they had. And unfortunately, you do have to get that many, even in a small community, if you have three to nine haulers, you have to get that many samples in order to get it. And in fact, I'm probably one of the few people that can read those invoices because there's extra fees, there's extra charges, there's um, administrative things on there. And so it takes a lot of time to put that data together. But um, that would be my one word of advice is if, you, if you're looking at organized collection ahead of time to do a price survey to understand what the prices really are because what they report is not what the prices are. And, and that's a given. So just definitely. Can I also add from Maplewood's perspective after going through organized collection now, they have increased their recycling by 22%. Uh. Minneapolis has also been in the news and they've increased their recycling by some of these best practices. So I think that you know going back to what's going to encourage more cities to do it, when they can have some pressure that they need to increase their recycling rates. They need to stop not only stopping the flow in the morning, but there's some costs and some other things, pressures too, that could hopefully. Yeah, that, that gets back to like St. Anthony's 16 different items that were important to them as they looked at organized collection. It's not just the price, it's not just the safety, it's not just the recycling, it's not just the bulk. It's, it's, it's a variety of things that are important to the community. And I'm going to wrap up by saying it's amazing how garbage and recycling touch so many pieces of your community. A lot of the best practices that are going to be in the final document also work with the business community. Because I think that, that one of the things that cities work very hard to do 
is to help their businesses do things more efficiently and more sustainably and better and help them be more sustainable and more economically successful. So I didn't touch a lot on um, some of the business best practices that are going to be in the documents, but if you, my contact information is there, if folks have ideas, if you've got things that work for you, things that really didn't work for you, and you're saying, <clears throat> don't find anybody else to do that, um, please, I, I'd really like to know about those things, um, because this, this document is meant to assist cities, and the more information, the more ideas we get, the more practices, the better off we'll all be together. Susan, thank you uh, very much. Thank you to all the webinar uh, participants. Um, and people can reach Susan at false.com, right? Yeah. Um, Susan.young at false.com. I spell the usual way. Susan.young yep. at false.com. Well, I uh, thank you all. We have a um, <clears throat> slide up here about the next uh, workshop and the PowerPoint uh, summary. Uh, would be prepared. Matthew puts up a blog, um, which we'll post on the front page of the Green Step Cities website. So, uh, with that, one last comment, question? Quick question on practice number 22 uh, for Green Step Cities on mandating collection of three or more recyclable materials from commercial entities. Um, will that be in effect in 2016 automatically? Uh, so this is Tim Potter from the MPCA. That will be true of the metro area. So uh, what Kay's referring to, the uh, legislature last year passed a commercial recycling mandate for the seven county metro area would apply to any business that generates more than four cubic yards of trash per week. They'll be subject to the same requirements that the public entities have been required to do for years to recycle at least three materials. It's not necessarily true for greater Minnesota. So certain cities and communities outside the seven metro areas, I think looking at commercial recycling is going to be really important. Uh, you can't get to these goals without having both residential and commercial participation in recycling programs. All right. Well, with that, uh, we conclude. Make sure you grab a little something, uh, bagels, uh, fruits, coffee before you go. Thank you all.